Okay, hello. Um, I think my opening joke, I was thinking for my opening joke, it should be something like, <clears throat> usually I use Monzo to, I use, usually I use Monzo to buy my beers, but this evening Monzo is buying me beers, something like this. I probably need to work on that a bit, okay. I'll work on it before the next gig, almost uh, Okay, so I'm going to be talking about scaling iOS at Bumble. Okay, so who am I? I've been doing iOS since 2010, and fun fact, so Tris here, is still working at the first company I worked at doing iOS where I started in 2010, I suppose. And I also learned that apparently some of my terrible code from back then is still making the company money. So I'm not sure how I should feel about that. I suppose proud, I suppose. I, I'm not getting any royalties though. Um, okay, so yeah, previously I worked at Zolando, Makodo, Memrise and SoundCloud. And I've been specializing in kind of like core stuff for the last four or so years. And I've been at Bumble since the beginning of last year, and I'm a senior, a senior iOS core team engineer there, and there's a bunch of Bumbles in this corner to the right here, so you can meet them later. So who are we? Um, probably you know us. So Bumble launched in, the, the, the other guys probably know these stats better than me, I hope they're accurate. So Bumble launched in 2014, with the number three downloaded dating app. Um, we also own Badoo, which is even older. That's a very early pioneer of the dating app business, um, which is the number two dating app globally, apparently. Um, we also own the Fruits app, which is the number two dating app in France, which has a Gen Z focus. And as a company, we went public in 2021. So this presentation is going to be about scaling a medium-sized iOS product to the next level. So why do I say medium? I chose medium because it's between small and large, obviously. Uh, and in my, my reckoning, large is your Googles and your Facebooks. And small is your indie developer at home. So medium, we're certainly between those two, so. All right, so in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about scale at Bumble, and then I'm gonna be talking about solutions we use to tackle our scale, and then I'm gonna be giving some conclusions. Actually, there's gonna be some tips and tricks, and apparently we're not gonna do questions. I'd say you can grab me to ask me questions later, but I may be running off excitingly to finish the project that I'm talking about this very evening. I know that's very exciting for none of you apart from the Bumble guys, but you can maybe ask them for information about what, what's happening today and tomorrow. Mostly I'm gonna be breaking everything. That's actually what's mostly happening. Okay, so scale of Bumble. Okay, so we have dozens of iOS engineers, hundreds of modules, uh, more than a hundred feature workspaces, which are like a, a playground kind of concept. Um, we have millions of lines of code of Swift. We have only a tiny bit of Objective-C, um, which is nice. Um, and we have more than ten, tens of thousands of lines of custom tooling. Still medium size. Okay, and there's a, oh, there you go. Okay, so this is just, a small piece of a dot diagram of all of our modules. You've seen these dot diagrams where they're just a million pages wide. This is, this is one of them. So we've got lots of modules. Um, so as I said before, scaling challenges, we're in this medium in between scale um, where we're not gigantic Google scale or Facebook scale or I don't know which other Silicon Valley giant you'd want to talk about. But then we're also not a couple of people in a bedroom. So we're in the middle, we're in this kind of gray area between the two where we have a lot of stuff, but we don't necessarily have unlimited budgets to deal with this. So we have to be pragmatic about our solutions. 
Um, on this graph, we did a projection where this part is our module counts. There's some difference between these lines, but if you pay attention to the blue line, this is where we tracked our growth of module counts historically, and we projected it forward. And I think the statistic was we were expecting by 2027 that our number of modules was going to double, something like this. Um, but we're already hitting the kind of classic problems you get of build times, typical problems working in Xcode, working with traditional Xcode projects. Um, so we have a lot of tooling that parses Xcode projects, which are these huge human readable but not human manipulatable text files from the 90s. We don't use storyboards, which makes life a little bit easier, but a lot of parsing of very verbose text. Um, we have Xcode developer quality of life issues. We have already a lot of modules. We have this expected growth you see on here. Problems with opening times, slow file operations, etc., etc. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these problems. Uh, the team is growing. We hope it will continue to grow. And we also have a high priority on Swift UI. So this is our situation right now. So the good stuff about what we've got, uh, we've got a very layered architecture. We have something like five formal layers. Um, we have pretty good modularization, even very good modularization. Um, and there's a lot of uniformity to those modules. Um, we have decent custom tooling, but maybe more of it than we'd like to have. Um, we use XC configs for our configuration settings, so our settings are at least not buried inside those project files. So having them in the config files makes life a lot easier. Um, we have feature workspaces, so we have this concept where people can work on their features in isolation. That's nice. We have a very powerful CI, I think. We have lots of testing using various strategies. Um, side note, we use explicit project dependencies, not implicit workspace dependencies. So there's a lot of good stuff, but we have pretty large scale and we want to handle it better. So what are our goals? I think the main goal is break free of Xcode. Well, I don't mean not to use Xcode, I mean break free of the limits of managing everything the Xcode way. So we're still gonna be editing code and developing features in Xcode, but not letting it limit how we do things. So almost certainly, well, certainly generating projects. So not having Xcode as the core controller of everything. We want to reduce or even remove our custom tooling, because that's stuff we have to maintain. Uh, we don't get benefits of using open source tooling where we don't have to maintain it ourselves. We'd like to be more lightweight, so managing these huge project files is a pain and it adds friction and you can't change things around. Um, yeah, reduce modularization friction. Maybe we'd like to improve our build times, or at least we'd like to move in the direction where build times could be improved. Uh, and other exciting future possibilities. So it's just breaking through, breaking out of the walled garden, you could say, to a certain extent. So the solutions we looked at are Swift Package Manager, SPM, Tuist, and Bazel. So we'll start with SPM. Of course, you all know it. Um, it's the first party solution and you've already got it. So it's got the benefit, you don't have to install it. It's already there. It's the Swift solution. It's directly integrated into Xcode. And there, for that reason, we initially preferred it. Um, I should probably mention at this stage, you might be thinking, I think that people usually think about SPM as a, as a way to manage third party dependencies. But in this case, we're planning to use SPM to manage all of the dependencies, including our own internal dependencies. So that's a pretty key point. Uh, we don't have that many third-party dependencies, but we've got hundreds of internal modules, and we want a system to do everything. Tuist. Um, so it's Xcode only oriented, so it's a way of generating Xcode projects, but more. And they call themselves by third-party, for third-party. 
Um, it's been around for a pretty long time. I'm sure pretty much everyone knows it. Um, it's got custom commands, it's got plugins, it's got graph inspection, it's got asset management, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. And there's another, another from their website probably, bootstrap, maintain, and interact with Xcode projects at any scale. It's like, oh, that sounds, that sounds like us. And Bazel, there's a funny joke about Bazel, I'm not sure if anyone's been on the website, but people get confused about how you pronounce it. And someone, one of the developers has written on the, um, uh, on the site, someone says, how do you, how do you pronounce it? And the response is, oh, like, like the herb. <laughs> so basil, then. But apparently you are supposed to say basil because it's, um, it's Californian, of course. Uh, so it's the open source version of Google Blaze. It's very mono repo oriented, but doesn't have to be. It's a true build system. It's a build system. Um, it has hermeticity. There's a, it, this, this emoji is more like a troll, but you have to think that it's a hermit. Um, it can do true remote, true possibly remote caching. So in theory, it has this whole concept through the hermeticity that if the inputs, you can guarantee the inputs are the same, therefore you can guarantee the outputs the same, therefore you can cache perfectly. Um, so you might never have to build anything twice ever again, which would be nice. Um, it has a graph query language. It has a lot of very powerful tools at the heart of this build system. But the developer experience is definitely secondary. So it's very unfamiliar. Well, this is a, possibly a little bit, I should talk about this later, but I've been reorganizing these slides. So. But it's very Xcode-less. It's flexible to the max, and in theory, you can integrate everything. So let's not talk about it too much right now. Okay, so the process we went through was for all of these all of these tools focusing on the Bumble app because it's it's the more modern one it's it, it plays by the rules that we have a lot more um, experiment um, start converting some small modules see how the, see how the tool works and then slowly work up to converting the whole thing in the proof of concept um, try to optimize it a bit and then assess the results so this Hilarious GIF represents me working away for months and months. Results, if only it was that quick in real life. Um, okay, so number one, SPA. Okay, so this is an example manifest, abridged. Um, you may have seen these, probably most people have seen these before by now. I was quite new to it when I was working on it, so. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice, neat, it's a nice, neat for, manifest format. It certainly beats thousands of lines of Xcode project with references and UUIDs and all of this verbose stuff. Um, it can handle things like transitive dependencies. It can handle packages. It can ha handle local, local dependencies. Uh, it can do a lot of nice stuff. I won't talk about it in detail, but if you haven't seen it before, it looks a bit like that. So, learnings. So here's, a, here's the navigation bar, na navigation panel in Xcode, and here's a bunch of our internal modules in a huge long list. And when you're done, it's a really, really long list because it's hundreds of modules. Uh, yeah, so we're using it for first party modules. So something like the Bumble app has got quite a few hundred modules in there, and these nice brown boxes you get used to seeing. Um, but the integration in Xcode is really good. Um, there are some interesting points if people haven't worked with SPM a lot. Um, so SPM is the Swift package manager, as you know. But when you're building iOS projects, you build on top of that. So what does that mean? So Swift build doesn't build iOS. It builds um, cross-platform open source Swift. So even though there, you might see some hacks online about building iOS directly with Swift build, I mean, essentially you're using Xcode build, and Xcode build can do it. Um, there's some other fun things like binary target doesn't exist in pure SPM, only in Xcode build. There's some interesting little um, disjoints between SPM, pure SPM, and doing iOS project SPM. 
It also can't do app targets as, as well because that's iOS. Uh, but they are, there are some quite nice ways you can solve that by generating a very, very minimal stub project. I used Xcode Gen to just define a project that has the main file, if appropriate, the launch screen, the property list. I think that's the bare minimum. And then you just link in your parent, your top level framework and it just works. So you can do a very minimal stub on top. Um, and then the Xcode project is an artifact, something that just keeps Xcode happy. This is kind of the focus. Just do what Xcode needs, but don't have that as your source of truth. Um, the integration in Xcode is very slick. Uh, the package description API from the previous slide is very nice. Um, you have lib Swift package manager, which is the open source shareable library, which is very nicely architected and you can share it and you link it with your tools. That all works wonderfully. The documentation is terrible because this is Apple and they can't afford to write good documentation. Yeah, if you're working with Libs with PN, you have to just find things for yourself. The bad. So I mentioned slick Xcode integration with an asterisk, if you noticed. But the performance is... Mm, leaves something to be desired. So remember that we're not just pulling in 10, 20, 30 third-party dependencies. We're managing hundreds of internal dependencies and we want to do it all under one umbrella. The performance would need to already be pretty, pretty nice because we're already thinking about the modules doubling in five years time. And the performance was not nice. Um, key points performance, yes. So the build time is basically the same because you're essentially you're building the same code with the same compiler, that's all fine. Um, graph resolution. So SPM's managing this graph. Um, I'm not sure if I moved the slide, but I'm, I had a slide later where the way SPM is integrated into Xcode is a lot like playgrounds where it wants to keep compiling your code and having everything ready all the time. Well, SPM wants to do that with your modules. So every time you change something, it recomputes everything and everything's ready for you. But if you have hundreds and hundreds of modules, that's not, that's not much fun. So I think that this, maybe there's more details here, but almost two minutes for doing an uncached resolve of all of our modules for Bumble.app, I believe. I think there's more info on the next slide. Uh, managing internal dependencies, actively editing. Yeah, so as I kind of already said, you're using SPM to manage all of these modules and you want to be actively working on them. So it's going to be actively recalculating. Um, it does that when you add a file, when you delete a file, when you rename a file, and apparently also sometimes when you just edit a file. So it's very eager to help you, but it's not very fast at its job. Yeah, so here you go. This is where we were doing performance analysis, where you, you have the uncached performance, and it's, it's linear but it's not pretty. We did experiments by adding more modules. So you've got like one, 1,200 modules and it's taking almost three minutes. The cache performance is pretty nice, but my concern is when you're switching branches a lot, you're probably going to have the uncached performance much more than you want to. So yeah, caching is applied, linear growth, worst case is very questionable, the scaling is unacceptable in our case especially when you're switching branches. Um, the best case recalculation is frequent. So the developer quality of life was already going to be poor for us, and that's not a good place to start. Uh, and it's poorly serving our use case. So not good news. Tuist. OK, so again, the manifest. So there's two screenshots on here. At the bottom here, we have the kind of native API, where I'm defining a project with a name, with the organization, some scheme. There's a lot more stuff in here than in the SPM manifest, but there's a lot more features in Xcode. But up here, we're using this project description helpers API, and you can condense a lot of this down. We've got very uniform modules ourselves, so we can dry out a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, then much larger than SPM for the native file format, but you can condense things down. Um, so there's a macro style approach you can use here. So you notice this helper says project dot 
contract module because this is an example of a contract module. So it's a bit like a macro. And in the case of Bazel, macros are everything. So you have the ability to dry things out and things get really nice and compact, which is what we want. Okay, so learnings. Uh, this is the same nav navigation panel with a Tuist generated project. Doesn't look so different and exciting because it's really just an Xcode project, but that's also a benefit. Uh, so the good, it works. It does what we want it to do and nothing more and without surprises, which was actually the problem with SBA. It tried to do too much for us maybe. Um, the performance is comparable, completely comparable because it's essentially generating us the same thing. It's a very familiar user experience, developer experience. Uh, it has a lot of secondary features which we haven't used a lot yet, like the caching. So can't comment too much about those, but it's exciting that we might be able to use them in the future. Um, however, some of the downsides, project open time was a bit slow. I mean, it's already slow, but we didn't gain anything from that. It's a bit slow. And also closing these projects, sometimes you have to kick it really hard to close the project. Um, it also has an artifact cache, so when you're generating projects, the command is to us generate, and it has an artifact cache for the operation, and when the cache is cold, it's pretty slow. When the cache is warm, it's pretty good. When you switch branches, mm, mm, you know, some limitations there. Um, it's a, quite opinionated about where it puts things, like it, it decides this layout, which is it's based on where things are on the disk. Maybe it's not exactly what you might want, but it's opinionated. Okay, so project open time. So yeah, can be, can be a bit slow. It's linear again, you have cached and uncached, doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, the big difference for us is we were using explicit dependencies before where everything is explicitly linked. And with Tuist, we're using workspaces with implicit modules, which is much more convenient, but slower. So the scaling is linear. When we tested this, we were a bit unsure about whether or not we were getting false negatives because of the performance or efficiency cores that are in use. So this is just something that's mm, undesirable, but not as bad as the SPM case. Okay, Basil, AKA the beast. Um, yeah, so here's a, basal, here's a basal build file. I hope you like Python or something like Python. Um, so yes, very steep learning curve. Um, I think even though I made quite quick progress in the beginning, it took me longer to get something working with Bazel easily than either of the other solutions. Um, it has very patchy documentation. You do end up looking through the source code quite a lot of times. It uses this language called Starlark, which is, I call it Python for beginners. But it actually makes sense why they use it after a while. It's sort of Python, and then you use a feature of Python that it can't do, and then you have to rewrite it in a really kind of beginner's kind of way. But there are reasons for that. But it looks like this. It's not completely terrible. Um, so learnings from Bazel. Picking the right rules is absolutely critical. There are many different rule sets out there doing similar things. Some of them are much better than others. Until you've used them, you don't know that. Uh, you could invest, invest a bunch of time getting something working with one rule set, only to then need to do something else and find out the rule set you've been using can't do it. So then you have to switch to another rule set and redo everything. That's really a lot of fun. Um, so there's multiple overlapping rule sets doing similar things. You get some dependency challenges because they also have dependent on each other with versioning. So this is not problems that you get with the other sets of tools at all. Um, however, when it comes together and you start getting things working, you do start to see what it can do for you. So it does become fun and you can start doing things, nice things when things are working. And yes, it, the build's very, very fast, and the caching seems to be very, very effective, and that's, that's quite exciting. But you have to ask yourself the question about maintenance, because it's a bit brittle, and versions change, and yeah. Uh, so similar to Tuist, really the key with Bazel is writing macros 
based around the kind of tasks that you want to do. So in here, there's, there's some shared macros here I made. This one does a module, this one does a project, this one does a test support module for helpers for testing. And if you orient it around these macros, it becomes so much better, just like the same with Tourist. Yeah, so, but on the positive side, potentially huge rewards with Bazel. So, what did we decide? And well, see, GIFs don't really work well if the if the latency is too bad, but okay. Tourist. So yeah, this evening, apparently, I'm migrating as the Tourist. A major, very busy week this week. So, why? Reasons. So, it's probably kind of obvious from the presentation, it does what we need right now. Um, it unblocks us changing to something. It's short-term, low-risk, medium benefit. So, I don't want to put it down by saying medium benefit. You could say Basil's potentially very high benefit, but it's also medium to high, if not high risk. So, it's a good cost-benefit analysis. It's feasible to roll back completely. Um, it has a very familiar dev experience, so that's very preferable. And it has potentially exciting features that we could use in the future. It has build caching, much more limited than Bazel because it's limited by what Xcode build can do. It can do test result caching, that's really nice. So if you run a test bundle twice and nothing's changed, it won't run the tests. And some, some, basically some of the more advanced features it can do are similar to Bazel, but less robust. So, what about Bazel? So for us, it's definitely the logical next step, unless something else comes out, but that doesn't seem very likely. It's still on our roadmap, and basically we didn't feel that we were ready for it yet. Because we have a lack of skills and experience, um, maintenance is definitely a problem where it could be broken and nothing, no one can build anything. And if you don't have, if you have the bus factor of only having a few people that can fix it, that's definitely a problem with Basil. And everything I read about it says, don't do it prematurely. So don't think you're cool because you're doing a hobby app and you thought I'll use Basil because I'm sure that I'll have 10 million lines of code in a couple of years. Terrible idea. Only use it when you really need to. And it's much riskier for these high high cost reasons. But by moving away from Xcode projects and moving towards a manifest approach, it's really laying the ground for any other manifest approach. So what else have I got? Getting close to the end here. Conclusions. Um, CocoaPods, yeah, we were talking about CocoaPods earlier. So SPM is CocoaPods, the power of Apple. I, d I don't know for a new project now, if there's any reason to use CocoaPods. I don't want to hate on CocoaPods, but it seems that SPM is pretty mature, and there seem to be negligible reasons why you might want to use CocoaPods these days. Uh, so, I, uh, yeah, I mentioned this point about when you're using a playground, it has this manually or automatically run switcher, so it wants to compile the code for you, but mm, I usually turn it off. It's nice, but I prefer to just press play when I want it. The problem with SPM in Xcode is it doesn't give you this control, and it's just constantly trying to recalculate. And if it had this control, perhaps it would be considerably more useful for large projects. Yeah, complexity, that's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Tips and tricks, yeah, a couple of tips and tricks, if they're helpful for people in the future. SPM seems to be greater than CocoaPods these days, although you need additions to do app level things. Um, I think it's definitely the way to go for smaller apps. And once you have an SPM based project, for even for a smaller app, as it grows, it'll be easy for you to go to another manifest based solution like Tourist or Bazel. So I don't see any reason to use CocoaPods, I'm afraid. Sorry, CocoaPods. Um, Tourist. Uh, if you can make your modules uniform, if your modules are uniform and you can use these macros to make your manifest files much, much smaller, that's a definite benefit, so you could prepare for it. If you have a lot of very random modules that are all very different, it becomes less appealing, I think. So yeah, project description helpers. We should have used them much earlier in the project, but you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Um, my number one tip for Bazel is 
to take a top-down approach. So the other two ist and SPM, I started with the small modules and worked my way up. But this was a terrible idea with Bazel because at the end of the day, you still need to be able to generate user-friendly Xcode projects. And from what I can see, this um, rules Xcode proj, which is now under the mobile native foundation banner, is the one that has the features that you'll need. It has all of the features. But you are going to be using the rules that it's dependent on. I'm not sure I explained that very well, but the point is you'd start by saying, okay, this is the rules I need for my Xcode projects, and I'm going to use all the rules it provides for my modules, for my unit tests, for these things like this. So it's kind of start at the top. Um, don't start at the bottom and then have to redo everything three times like I did. That's, that's the problem. Yeah, and develop macros for your use cases, and this will make everything much nicer. And don't rush into it just because it's the big toy. Probably, probably you don't need it, to be honest, probably. Okay, thank you. I think that's, that's all for me. And I, I don't think we're going to do question questions, so I, I may not be here later, but there's a bunch of uh, Bumble guys in the corner there, you can ask them questions over beers, so thanks.